Okay, let's get started. Welcome back to quantum chemistry. What we are moving to from this lecture onwards is essentially a list of practical calculation tasks that as chemists you are likely to encounter in your daily practice. Again, the purpose of these lectures is not to give any rigorous background or any rigorous derivation as to what it is we'll be talking about, but rather to give you very practical down-to-earth recipes on what can be computed, how to compute it, on various mistakes that it's a good idea to avoid, and just to give you a general background on how these things are done. So we'll be going through uh, a list of properties in this lecture and in the next lecture, and I will just give you brief comments on each, uh, and practical advice, and in some cases literature references as to where to look for further information. Okay, starting with ionization energies. Uh, and ionization energy by definition is the energy of removing an electron from a molecule, so creating a positively charged ion and a free electron at infinity. And the simplest way to estimate it, it is not very accurate at all, is by the use of Koopman's theorem, which simply states, as intuition would perhaps suggest, that the first ionization energy is equal to the negative of the energy of the highest occupied molecular energy. Clearly, if we assume that the energy of the electron at infinity is zero, then when it drops into the potential well created by the homo, then the energy of extracting it from there has to be equal, or is approximately equal to homo. Now, in practice, this is not accurate enough because what we would assume under Koopman's theorem is that the electronic structure essentially remains unaffected by us taking the electron away. That's clearly not the case. There is something called orbital relaxation. When we take an electron out, the orbitals do change, and then the occupation numbers do change, so this orbital relaxation is important. And also, electron correlation is ignored. The original Koopman theorem is only provable for the restricted Hartree fog, uh, but can in principle be generalized uh, to post Hartree fog methods. But still, uh, there is a significant amount of electron correlation that's associated with the electron that we've just removed, and therefore it is also an approximation to treat uh, the electronic structure that has remained as something that's frozen. Now, in the case of DFT, it's not that straightforward, as I told you in the lecture about DFT. The DFT orbitals are not, strictly speaking, anything physical. They are a mathematical ansatz whose density has a physical meaning, but whose complex value didn't necessarily have one. And so it is a bit more dangerous in the case of DFT to try and use movements here. But thankfully, an equivalent can be found in the uh, shape of Yannick's theorem, which is formulated as the derivative of the total energy with respect to the occupation number of a given orbital. It is treated as a continuous variable. And then we can demonstrate, after a considerable amount of mathematics, that uh, it is equal, uh, this derivative is equal uh, to the energy of the corresponding orbital. So a bit more care has to be taken in the case of DFT. Uh, and though the basis set dependence is just what we would expect, uh, because the energies get asymptotically better and better as the basis set gets increased. So do their differences, but strictly speaking, differences do not have to become better as the basis set increases, only the energies do. But in practical cases, it is sufficient to just go to a big enough basis set or perhaps a CBS limit. And ionization potentials are okay. So if you start on a small basis set, uh, then the adiabatic ionization potential does sort of become better as you get to bigger and bigger basis set. Uh, but generally, even a double zeta is doing all right in this case. However, the reciprocal property, the energy of adding an electron to the electronic structure, because electron affinities are usually smaller than ionization potentials in terms of energies involved, it is often necessary to have a huge basis. You see a double zeta calculation doesn't even get the sign correctly in this case, and only in, can, in, in, in a complete basis at limit you can actually recover the number. That is hopefully okay, but still uh, these limitations of Koopman's theorem have to be taken into account. And generally, all in all, uh, 
as of the year 2012, it is not a good idea to use Kupman theorem as a measure of your ionization energies. So a much better way is uh, delta SC, I think is known. We just perform separate SCM calculations for the moment. The ion, so it could be hard folks, so it could be post hard folks, so it could be DFT, anything. And then we subtract the resulting energies. And clearly, because we have re optimized the electronic structure once we've taken the electron away, the orbital rearrangement is now taken into account. In the experimental context, it takes absolute tens of seconds, so very, very tiny amount of time. And so it is avoiding at least some of the policies that were talked about in the previous slide. Now, there are two practical variations on this. What we could also, of course, do is re-optimize the geometry. And if we do re-optimize the geometry, then the result is known as the adiabatic ionization energy. Typically, it is not something you would encounter, for example, in laser spectroscopy, because geometry rearrangement takes considerable time. So many optical excitations are, in fact, vertical, so the geometry doesn't have time to change. And so we just take the ground state geometry of the original molecule and we perform two SCF calculations on the same geometry. But in the case where we have to take into account geometry arrangement, it may be necessary to re-optimize the geometry. This is your choice and it should be based on your understanding of how the system works. So there is no universal recipe here. Uh, and obviously, as always, anions, because of their diffuse electronic structure, will require diffuse functions, sometimes quite a lot of them, to actually get things right. Here's a practical illustration of the huge difference between vertical and adiabatic ionization energies. This is, uh, I think, CH3 minus, so flat methane anion, uh, and that's the pyramidal uh, methane anion in a different electronic configuration. So an, er an excitation from here to here clearly has huge energy difference uh, to the excitation from here to here, and again the adiabatic one would be from here to here. So please take a good look and think about what your system actually is and what's it doing before computing the ionization energies. Uh, well, that's the highly accurate calculation of the ionization uh, of uh, all this is electron affinity, and that's the ionization of methyl. And you can see it shows reasonable convergence with respect to the basis set. That's the complete basis set extrapolation, so exponential fit. And so typically at about five zeta level of the extrapolation thereof, at least for this small molecule, you do get an accurate result insofar as vacuum calculations go. Now related to that is the question of computing the electron density distribution. It is necessary in quite a few contexts. In magnetic resonance, we would like to know the spin densities at a nucleus point that are related to hyperfine couplings. The charge distribution will be related to electric multipolar moments and various salvation energies. So it is often necessary to compute the electron density distribution in the molecule. And it's a straightforward business. It's obtained just like the sum of the probability distributions of each individual electrons. You take the orbitals, you absolute square them, and you add them together. Then each orbital has an expansion in terms of the basis set. And so once we plug this into here, we get this sum, which is summed over the coefficients of these orbitals and the orbitals themselves. Now, if we integrate this, if we integrate the electron density, clearly what we will obtain is the total number of the electrons in the system, which, if everything in the calculation is correct, should be an integer number. But this integral will have two distinct contributions. It will have the product of these coefficients, and it will take this integral. Now, those of you who did spin dynamics might recognize a similarity here. So this sum, over the coefficients is known as density matrix. And this integral, we talked about these integrals before, is just an overlap, a measure of overlap between this uh, function and this function in the basis set. And so once we use these definitions, what we'll find is the total number of the electrons is a scalar product between the density matrix and the overlap matrix, so just a trace of the product. 
And as we'll see in the subsequent slides, this density matrix and this overlap matrix are essential for the population analysis and the bond order analysis that are performed on the electronic density distribution once you have obtained it. Uh, so well, we have now computed this total number of electrons. What we can do is partition this total number of electrons into individual contributions. It is often uh, something that chemists want. They would like to know how much uh, of an electron density or how many electrons are there in a specific place in the structure. For example, if we have a bond, they would like to know the order of that bond and that will be related to the number of electrons participating. If we've got two electrons, then it's just a bond. If we have four electrons, then it's probably a double bond and things like that. So it's necessarily not a very quantitative measure, but it is often very useful to chemists as a qualitative picture of what it is that they have. And as you well know, experimental chemists have got amazing intuition as to how the molecules are built and how they react. Uh, famously having established that methane, for example, is tetrahedral way before the computational chemists actually went computed it and found out that in the Schrodinger equation it to be tetrahedral. Okay, so what we'll take is we'll partition this total number of electrons into contributions from individual orbitals. So if we take two orbitals and uh, one of them and the other are located on the same atom, then we'll ascribe all the resulting density to that atom and we will interpret that electron density as contributing to the charge of that atom. Now, if we have a pair of orbitals in this convolution that are located on different atoms, then we will share the density between the two atoms and ascribe it to both of them uh, as contributing to the charges. And so we can generalize it then as not just contributing to the charge, so the number of electrons, but also contributing to the spin density on a particular atom through the contributions belonging to the individual spin. So we can then have the density, spin density matrix alpha, uh, giving the coefficients, uh, com being composed of the coefficients of the spin up electrons, and we can have the density matrix of the beta electrons. This all becomes useful uh, in the so called Mulliken scheme of population and charge analysis. We take the data that we've just defined, and for each atom in the system, we define a charge of that atom, which is the charge of the nucleus minus the local contribution from the electrons. If we have the two orbitals on the same atom, we just ascribe the charge straight to the atom. And if we have the two orbitals on two different atoms, each of them receives, by convention, a half. Now, clearly, in practical situations, because of difference in electronegativities, it, would, it may be rather different from a half, but uh, this scheme is only quantitative uh, only qualitative and does not claim to actually reproduce uh, the exact numbers. It is to give a qualitative picture of what's going on. So we can have these rules. We start with the charge of the bare nucleus. If two basis functions are both on the atom, we assign all the density to that atom. If the basis function 1 is on atom A and basis function 2 is on atom B, we split the corresponding density into halves and assign them, uh, the resulting halves to those atoms. Uh, so, if we sum, sum the uh, densities and the overlap integrals without sign, then we'll get atomic population. Uh, so, how many electrons there are. And if we include spin, we'll get atomic spin densities. Uh, they're not very useful in, in practical spin dynamics, but basically they give you an indication. Uh, they are, in many cases, good enough. So useful features, uh, as you saw, this is a qualitative method, but it's qualitatively correct, and well, really no quantitative method exists anyway, so we might just as well use it. It's very cheap to calculate, it's a ground state property, and it's been empirically shown through about maybe 20 or even 40 years of research that it shows current trends in chemical reactions. 
There are obviously downsides. Uh, diagonal elements of the intensity matrix could be larger than two, implying uh, something unphysical, that there are more than two electrons in an orbital. The off-diagonal elements may be negative, uh, so equal partitioning, of course, doesn't have any foundation. Then if we take a diffuse function, which could be so diffuse as to span the entire molecule, it is still counted as contributing to the center to the atom on which it leaves, which is not a very good idea. And then if we take the resulting molecular charges and we try computing the multiple moment of the molecule, we'll find that it's nowhere close to the actual multiple moments. And so, well, these are clearly big limitations. Uh, a slight refinement was suggested by Lodin, who used the fact that we can permute the operators under the trace, and so he split the overlap matrix in halves uh, and decided to compute the numbers like this. It is clearly a mathematically equivalent transformation, but in the various approximations and assumptions that are made in uh, Mulliken's analysis, it actually fixes at least points one, two, and three, but it is clearly approximate, so points four and five are still unfixed. Bond order, we can define a bond order in a similar fashion. Uh, if we have an atom A and an atom B, uh, then we will define a sum over all such electron density as has one basis function on A and another basis function on B. So clearly a sum will contribute in some sense to the bonding between the atoms, and so such a sum is known as a bond order, and Lodin's uh, extension is done in a similar fashion by just splitting this under the trace. And here's an illustration of how it works in practice. If we plot uh, the overlap population against the bond order indices, uh, we'll find that indeed things that ought to have a double bond seem to have a double bond. Things that ought to have a single bond or one and a half bond do happen to have a one and a half bond. So even though approximate, this population analysis does in practice turn out to be quite useful. And here's a table of bond orders. So if we take propylene, we'll find that bonds that are supposed to be single bonds actually turn out to be pretty close to single bonds. The bonds that are supposed to be uh, double uh, can sometimes be sort of not quite double, but in other cases actually double. Uh, so if you take a cetaldehyde and a CO bond, then the total fundus is 1.6 in here. So it does tend to tally reasonably well with our chemical intuition as to what the bond order is in a particular molecule. Well, this relates to molecular orbitals because bonds are a product of there being a molecular orbital that binds the atoms together. Um, we will need these orbitals. They are, in a way, also something highly artificial. The electron density and its partitioning is something that's clearly chemical, but a molecular orbital being an eigenfunction of the Fock operator or a post-Fock operator is, in a way, uh, something that contributes to the inner workings of the molecular electronic structure energy theory, but needn't necessarily be directly observable. Still they're useful, and what they're useful in particular for is deciding where the bonds are, where the electrons are clustered, and for that what we often require, and that's another buzzword that will come up an awful lot as you do your calculations, is localization. Now, I think most of you have done the theory of determinants in your algebra course, and you would know that determinants are invariant under arbitrary orthogonal transformations. Uh, in complex spaces, they become unitary transformations. So if we take a matrix and we apply a unitary transformation to it, then the determinant does not change. What this means in practice is the final energy and the final electron density is invariant under a surprisingly rich class of transformations. We can take linear combinations of our orbitals, and so long as the resulting transformation is unitary, uh, neither the energy nor the determinant will actually change. So we have 
certain amount of liberty in uh, varying the underlying orbitals without changing the chemical results of our calculation. And what we'd like to do in particular is to make the orbitals as local as possible. When we just do hard reflux theory or post hard reflux theory and we look at canonical orbitals at the eigenfunctions of those operators, it will often be the case that those eigenfunctions span the entire volume. So somehow the eigenfunction stretches across the whole thing and correlates to the whole volume. And yet we know from semiconductor works, from work on spin dynamics, and from quite a few experimental observations that the correlation length in the molecule is in fact limited and that the interactions are local. And so it is almost unphysical to see an orbital spanning the entirety of the molecule when we know in practice that the interactions are local. And so this localization idea is not just mathematically motivated, it is motivated physically from our knowledge of the fact that interactions in usual chemical systems are highly local. Well, what we can do is we can design such an orthogonal transformation as would try and condense uh, the actual orbitals as close as possible, but at the same time as far apart from each other as possible, uh, whilst preserving the total slate determinant. So what we can do is we can try, for example, maximizing the distances between orbital centroids, that's uh, the criterion, you have to find the maximum of this functional in the space of orbitals, and the so-called voice criterion, so we uh, minimize the dispersion of each individual orbital. Uh, we can take an alternative criterion and we could ma maximize the self-repulsion energy of each orbital, so we push each orbital as close and compact as possible, uh, generate similar results, or we could try and maximize the sum of density squares on all atoms, so try and shift uh, a specific orbital into as few atoms as possible. Uh, they generally lead to broadly similar results, but this last criteria, the Pipe-Pipe-Kinese criteria, tends to avoid a few problems that uh, the voice uh, localization has. One particular problem is if we take things like ethylene, you know it's a double bond system, so it's got a sigma contribution and a pi contribution, but what voice localization does is it creates the so-called banana bond. It mixes the sigma and the pi bond, and okay, it's an equivalent transformation, nothing changes physically, but we're not used to having these banana bonds. Uh, and this pi uh, maze localization actually keeps sigma bond and the pi bond quite neatly, uh, in a way that is similar to the canonical orbital, so whereas the Boys method creates these banana bonds. In all other respects, the two methods are useful, uh, are, are similar, so it is usually preferable to use this localization criteria in practice. One particular advantage that comes with locality is the fact that many two electron integrals start being very small in a localized basis set. You see, if we have pushed one orbital on one end of the molecule and another orbital on another end of the molecule, well, what will happen is A, the overlap integral isn't going to be all that large, and B, probably even the pool of integrals going to be pretty small. And this is the basis of the so-called locality approximations in post-Hartree-Fock methods, where before computing the MD2 integrals, for example, we perform orbital localization, uh, and possibly also include the resolution of identity methods that I was talking about in the previous lectures, to try, uh, sometimes approximately, sometimes exactly, to push the number of integral evaluations as low as possible through pre-screening. We could, for example, separate the integrals into several bins, where the outer bin would correspond to orbitals which are very remote, and then the lower bin would correspond to the orbitals which are very close together, and then we include some bins and exclude others, and in that way, it was demonstrated quite recently, in fact, uh, by Fred and uh, his co-workers that we actually get linear scaling for methods which used to scale as O n to the fourth, O n to the fifth. And so, highly correlated treatments are becoming available for very large quality. 
So two approximations are made, excitation that is restricted to be local, and then the correlation between distant pairs of local orbitals is ignored, and both make physical sense. And typically, if you look at these numbers, you'll see that about 95% of the correlation energy is preserved. The derivatives are unaffected. Uh, it's still a continuous function of quite a few things. Uh, and so we recover most of the correlation energies, even for things which are pretty expensive, like CCSD and CCSDT, at very, very modest cost. So when you are dealing with, for example, geometry optimizations, uh, and calculations which do not require extreme accuracy, it is of great practical benefit to use these locality approximations to cut down the calculation terms. Uh, with these things, you can do things on really polypeptides uh, and large molecules like that in reasonable time. Right, the next thing that you would often be tasked with computing in practice, particularly if you're doing infrared spectroscopy, or calculating various statistical properties such as PKA is vibrational frequencies. Now, if we are sitting in a minimum, then we can expand uh, our energy in a Taylor series, and in a minimum, this term, the gradient, would be zero. So, if we are sitting in a true and proper minimum, or well, let's put it that way, any stationary point, then we have this E of x zero, and we've got this second order term plus third order and so on contributions. So this matrix H, it's known as Hessian, will be the second derivative of the energy with respect to the two coordinate displacements. Now, if you remember your classical physics, we had something called a harmonic spring, which had this kind of potential, and so the K was, in fact, the second derivative of the energy with respect to the displacement. So what we can do is compute this Hessian matrix, diagonalize it, and its eigenvectors are called normal modes. They are uh, collective motions of atoms corresponding to well-defined vibrational frequencies in the system. And the corresponding eigenvalues are called uh, the vibrational frequencies. And each normal mode, because they are to second order orthogonal, actually behaves as a separate independent fold on the spring and just vibrates. And because this affects the vapor moment, it couples into electromagnetic fields. And these things can therefore be detected with standard optical spectroscopy techniques, such as infrared. Well, the practice is, of course, a bit more complicated than that. You remember that we are operating implicitly in the born oppenheimer approximation, and that second order approximation assumes that the potential is quadratic, so high order contributions are negligible. Neither is the case in practice. A or the Benheimer approximation breaks, particularly in systems involving hydrogen transport. And well, the potential are, potentials aren't actually quadratic. So what we will have to do in practice is either to actually scan honestly every direction coordinate space to compute the so-called unharmonicities, so third, fourth, and so on order corrections. This is hugely expensive and rarely, in fact, realistic. Or we can try and find an effective fudge factor to try and bring the vibration of frequencies computed in a harmonic approximation a bit closer to the experimental data for introducing an empirical correction factor. And well, this is another piece of semi-empirics. These factors have been tabulated for a large number of methods and a large number of basis sets. Go look in the literature, you'll find the model of huge reviews which tabulate these factors. And they are essentially just fudge numbers which bring your computed second order frequencies a bit closer to what's experimentally observed. And the difference is related to this picture. This is the harmonic potential, strictly quadratic. And it's the Morse potential, which is um, closer in practice to what is experimentally there. OK, so one of the reasons we would like to compute those vibrational frequencies is if we would like to compute thermodynamic properties of molecules. Now, as you know, things like internal energy, things like entropy, Gibbs free energy, enthalpy, 
can be expressed in terms of the partition function of the system. Now, the partition function will simply be a sum over all energy levels, including the statistics of those energy levels. But in practice, we do not, in fact, know all of them. In particular, what is essentially impossible to compute, at least at the current level of computational technology, is rotational vibrational couplings, various vibrational unharmonicities, various torsions, and things like that. So necessarily, what we'll have to do is make an approximation stating that the electronic degrees of freedom are independent from translational degrees of freedom, which is probably true in vacuum, that the translational degrees of freedom are independent from the rotational ones, also probably okay, but then that the rotational and vibrational degrees of freedom are also independent, and that's clearly an approximation. So, but then, well, in this approximation, which happens to be alright in practical situations, we and split our partition functions into these contributions, and we can use just the standard equations of statistical thermodynamics to get the properties out. So for internal energy, for example, electronic degrees of freedom born of Oppenheimer approximation, which is used as a baseline zero level, 3 halves RT for 3D translation, 3 halves RT for 3D rotation, that's known and system independent, but then the vibrational frequencies, which is appropriate statistics, will be system dependent because these frequencies depend on the system and the number of degrees of freedom is system dependent. Uh, but computing this sum once you know those frequencies is very straightforward and then we can compute enthalpy from that as u plus rt at a given temperature. Now, obviously the most expensive part of this is vibrational frequencies. And then while well, this is internal energy and enthalpy, we can compute entropy in a similar fashion the electronic part is just static, it depends on the multiplicity. Then the translational part is also known, although it involves molecular volume and complicated things like that. Then the rotational part is related to the tensor inertia, which is related to the molecular geometry, which you will have to optimize. And then the vibrational part is related to the vibrational frequencies. And then the Gibbs free energy is enthalpy minus well, as has been computed like this. Well, a very difficult calculation. All in all, although Gaussian, to its credit, does all these things automatically, it can have a few pitfalls, particularly if some of the frequencies are close to zero, and it not always detects and eliminates the rotational and translational contributions to these frequencies. Uh, clearly, we only have n minus 6 degrees of freedom rather than n in a molecule. Uh, 3 and minus 6 rather than 3 and more with um, atoms in it. Uh, but if you watch it, it does a pretty good job. The last slide for today is about the calculation of acidity constants. This is still, to a very large extent, an unsolved problem. My repeated attempts to compute these things and very, very long draws through the literature have come out with uh, an unflattering conclusion that in those situations where you do get the pKa right, it is mostly by accident. But in principle, if we had an accurate method to do all these things, this is how you would compute it. So delta G, as we know from thermodynamics, is a difference between reactants and the products, or rather I think it should be the other way around, product minus reactants in here. And what we have is we can just build these thermodynamic cycles. If we take a molecule which is an acid, dissociate, uh, in a gas phase, if we pull a proton off it, it will dissociate into a minus and a plus. We have a salvation stage for each. So, and then in a solvent, AH aqueous is A minus aqueous plus a proton salvated. And so we can compute uh, this delta G using the techniques that I have described. We can compute the salvation energy by computing the G in the solvent. We'll get to the latest calculations in a couple of lectures and subtracting it um, out, subtracting out the delta G in the gas. But there's an interesting problem here. You see, the proton doesn't have any electrons, so it's not an electronic structure calculation. And how do you do a salvation electronic structure calculation in something that doesn't even have electrons, it's an elementary particle. So it's a bit of a sticking point here with this proton. 
thankfully this hydration energy and solvation energies in the case of solvents other than water are known experimentally. So a combination of computed numbers and the experimental numbers in here will eventually get you the delta G in a solvent from a delta G in a gas and the delta Gs of salvation. A somewhat more accurate or at least somewhat more um, practically motivated scheme is similar to this one, is when we have a H plus water and then what we have is the elimination of H3O, hydroxonium, rather than to just H and clearly in water this is what happens and oftentimes it's not just H there are bigger clusters containing those proteins. It's not very clear how to include multiple sizes for such clusters, so again this is an approximation, but at least in this case we can do a calculation for the salvation energies in all four cases, and we can actually do uh, this uh, in the gas phase, and then we can extract the energy, uh, the delta G in the aqueous phase, and get out the PKA. So realistic available accuracy even with G3, the extremely expensive, highly correlated and multiply compensated method is plus minus one unit, but my practical calculations on slightly exotic systems have inevitably come up with a conclusion that uh, really it's very rare in this sort of accuracy bracket. So if you are computing PKAs, uh, well, uh, it will be difficult. Okay, that's the last slide for today, and we shall continue exploring the various properties 